Lost in the Alaskan Wilderness. My Survival Story. Part 1. Alright, everyone, strap in because I've got a tale that'll make you think twice about veering off trails, especially in the vast, untamed wilderness of Alaska. It's a story of survival, the kindness of strangers, kind of, and a whole lot of, what on earth was I thinking? So, there I was, your average Joe, with a bit more enthusiasm for adventure than sense. I decided to tackle the Alaskan wilderness, armed with nothing but my backpack, some basic supplies, and a wildly overestimated confidence in my navigation skills. The trip started off great. The scenery was breathtaking, the air was fresh, and I felt like I was truly part of nature. That was until I heard what sounded like a human scream for help. My heart raced. Someone was in trouble, and I, in my knight in shining armor fantasy, decided I had to help. I quickly turned off the trail, pushing through thick brush, convinced I was about to save the day. Fast forward 10 minutes, and the screams had stopped. I stopped too, suddenly realizing I had no idea which way I had come from. The trail was gone, swallowed by the dense Alaskan wilderness. No problem, I thought. I'm an intelligent guy. I'll find my way back. Spoiler alert, I did not find my way back. For two days, I wandered. I tried to use the sun to navigate, but the dense tree canopy and overcast skies made it nearly impossible. I rationed my food, collected water from streams, and at night, I curled up under the trees, trying not to think about the fact that I was the main course on the wilderness dinner menu. By the third day, desperation set in. My brilliant plan? Climb the tallest mountain nearby to get a better view and hopefully spot the trail. Sounds simple, but in reality, it was a Herculean task. The climb was steep, the terrain unforgiving, and my physical condition was deteriorating rapidly from the lack of proper food and rest. But I made it to the top. The view was spectacular, a sea of trees stretching to the horizon, majestic mountains in the distance, and not a single sign of human civilization in sight. No trail, no smoke signals, no flashing neon sign pointing the way out. Just me, the sky, and the overwhelming realization that I was truly, deeply lost. There I stood, on the summit, a mix of awe and terror filling me. I had set out on an adventure, seeking a connection with nature, but now, I was begging for a sign of human presence. The silence was deafening, the isolation complete. Part 2. When we last left off, I was standing atop a mountain, a picturesque yet utterly terrifying symbol of my isolation. Well, buckle up, because the journey from mountain peak to makeshift survivalist is both grim and, frankly, a bit gross. After the harsh realization that I was more lost than a left sock in a laundry room, I knew I had to get serious about survival. The first order of business was shelter. Using a combination of fallen branches, leaves, and whatever else I could scavenge, I fashioned a rudimentary shelter. It was no five-star hotel, but it was enough to keep the worst of the wind and rain off me. Next up, food. My supplies were dwindling, and unless I fancied a diet exclusively composed of pine needles, I needed to find a more substantial food source. I managed to fashion a spear of sorts from a sturdy branch. Hunting was a challenge, to put it mildly. My first few attempts at catching anything larger than a bug were dismal failures. Eventually, though, desperation and hunger led to a small victory, and I caught a rabbit. Now, here's where things took a turn for the bear grills, but make it amateur hour. Without a fire, my options were limited. Raw meat it was. If you're cringing reading this, imagine how I felt eating it. It was a desperate measure, and unsurprisingly, my body did not react well. I got sick, really sick. It was a low point, lying there, ill from raw meat, miles from anywhere, utterly alone. But, as they say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, or in my case, gives you a really upset stomach and a newfound respect for fire. My next priority was clear. I needed to make fire. Despite my best attempts, striking stones and trying to create friction with sticks, I was unsuccessful. The dampness of the environment and my lack of skill thwarted every attempt. In this weakened state, I stumbled upon a new lifeline, a waterfall. It was the most beautiful sight I had ever seen, not just for the water, but for the opportunity it represented. I decided to make camp nearby. The constant supply of fresh water was a game changer, and the area around the waterfall seemed more abundant in resources. I built a new, better shelter using the techniques I'd slowly been learning from my constant battles with nature. This spot by the waterfall became my new base of operations. It was here that I began to truly adapt to my situation, using the resources available to me in more efficient ways, though the challenge of creating fire still loomed large. 
As days turned into weeks, I found myself falling into a rhythm. Hunt, albeit more successfully with practice, gather, now with a keen eye for edible plants, and survive, each day a testament to human resilience. Yet, the isolation weighed heavily on me, a constant companion amid the sprawling beauty and unforgiving wilderness of Alaska. Part 3. Two months have passed since I first found myself stranded in the Alaskan wilderness. Two months of adapting, surviving, and clinging to the slim hope of rescue. In this chapter of my saga, I've gone from a bewildered hiker to something resembling a wilderness survivalist, albeit one who would rather be anywhere else. As days turned into weeks, and weeks into months, the initial panic and fear gave way to a resigned determination. I was not going to let this wilderness defeat me. My hunting skills, once laughably inept, had improved significantly. I could now track, hunt, and prepare a small game with a proficiency that would have surprised my former self. My diet expanded beyond the desperate days of raw meat, providing me with the energy and nutrients needed to tackle my next big project, building a cabin. Building a cabin next to the freshwater source seemed like the next logical step in my unexpected journey into wilderness living. Armed with an axe fashioned from a sturdy branch and a sharp stone, I began the arduous task of cutting down small trees and shaping them into logs. It was backbreaking work, but it gave me a focus, a purpose beyond mere survival. The cabin, while rudimentary, was a significant upgrade from my previous shelters. It offered better protection from the elements and a sense of permanence, a home in the midst of endless wilderness. Yet, the completion of the cabin was bittersweet. It was a monument to my survival but also a reminder of my isolation. Two months had passed with no sign of rescue, no hint that anyone was looking for me. It was time to take matters into my own hands. I had read somewhere that large signal fires could be seen from miles away, even by planes flying overhead. Clinging to this knowledge, I set about gathering as much wood as I could find. I chose a clearing near the cabin, one that offered the best chance of being seen from the sky. There, I constructed several large fire pits, ready to be lit at the first sound of an airplane. Day after day, I kept the fires burning, sending plumes of smoke into the sky, a desperate call for help etched into the wilderness. It became a ritual, part of my daily struggle to maintain hope in the face of overwhelming odds. Each fire was a message, a beacon of my existence, screaming into the void, I am here. Find me. But the skies remained empty, the vast wilderness around me untouched by the outside world. The signal fires, for all their promise, brought no sign of rescue. Yet, I refused to give up. Each day I continued to hunt, to build, to survive, and each day I lit the fires, hoping against hope that someone, somewhere, would see my signal and bring me home. Part 4. After six months lost in the Alaskan wilderness, my story found its conclusion, not with a whimper, but with the roar of a helicopter's blades cutting through the air, heralding my rescue. It was a regular day, or as regular as days could be in my new wilderness life. I was tending to my signal fires, more out of habit than hope. Then, out of nowhere, the distant sound of a plane. I'd heard planes before, always too far away, their paths never altering. This time was different. The engine's roar grew louder, closer, and then, miraculously, the plane dipped lower, circling above me. Someone on that passenger plane saw my fires, saw me. They radioed back to the airport, and within hours, a rescue helicopter was thundering over the horizon. The rescue was surreal. The faces of the rescue team, the sound of my name being called out, the realization that I was finally going home. It was overwhelming, a flood of emotions washing over me as I left my wilderness home behind. But the world I returned to was not the world I left. In the six months of my absence, life had moved on without me. My family, having mourned my loss, was shocked to see me alive. The hardest blow, though, was learning that my wife, believing me dead, had found solace in the arms of my best friend. They had moved on, building a life together in the wake of my presumed death. The home I had longed for, dreamed of during those cold, lonely nights, no longer existed. The life I returned to is unrecognizable, the pieces not fitting together as they once did. The pain of this realization was sharper than any hunger or cold I'd endured in the wilderness. The wilderness had tested my body, but this tested my heart, my spirit, I found myself adrift in a world I no longer understood, a world that had no place for me. So, I made a decision. With nothing left for me in the civilization I could no longer call home, I returned to the wilderness. The cabin I built, the land I had come to know, became my refuge once again. I chose to live off the land, to embrace the solitude that had once been my prison. 
The wilderness, with all its challenges and beauty, had become a part of me, a place where I found peace in the simplicity of survival. This is my final message to everyone here. Life is unpredictable, filled with twists and turns that can leave you lost, searching for a path back to something familiar. My journey taught me the importance of adaptation, of finding strength in the face of unimaginable challenges. The wilderness, once a place of fear and uncertainty, became my home, a testament to the resilience of the human spirit. Remember, life doesn't always go the way you expect it to. Be ready to adapt, to find your path even when the trail disappears beneath your feet. My story is one of survival, of loss, and ultimately, of finding peace in the most unexpected places.